All right, we might um, wrap it there. So really the, you know, it's really, I know, everyone wants to talk, it's exciting, it's exciting. Um, and, you know, I, f I think that one of the beautiful things about in-person events is you get to turn around and just and talk to someone in person and maybe exchange contact details or have a laugh. So, you know, now you've got someone that you know and we're gonna dive into a really, really awesome panel. And so tonight's topic is how to build a strong community. It's pretty broad and that's the point. And really the purpose of tonight is all about bringing everyone together uh, to connect, but also to educate you, to inspire you about how you can build a really strong and impactful community. I think something that's been really exciting is that we're seeing in, especially the startup space, a lot of prioritizing of this community role. On average, we're seeing about nine new hires at startups for a community manager a fortnight at the Community Collective, which is not a snapshot of the entire industry but it has seriously been prioritised and even an event like this um, for the first time, you know, running an in-person thing in Sydney is an amazing um, example of, of the power, but also the importance of community. Awesome, so how's it gonna run? Uh, in a moment, we're gonna introduce the panel and the, our moderator and we're going to hear from them for about half an hour or so, and then there'll be an opportunity for audience Q&A. So I want all of you to think of an amazing question. We'll pass the mic around, we'll, we'll do that whole in-person thing, um, so you don't have to log it in the chat. And then, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll be able to ask the amazing panel, which we'll introduce shortly. And then after that, we'll just, more networking, more drinks, more food, and, and then, we're, then we're done. So, tonight, definitely would not have been made possible without these amazing partners um, as well. So I just wanted to shout out um, CMX, um, especially the Australian chapter. We've got Yana, who's the chapter host. Uh, big round of applause for Yana and CMX. Thank you. Um, CMX is the global community for community professionals who here has heard of CMX before. Awesome. If you haven't, definitely check them out. And Seed Spaces, as we've mentioned, beautiful co-working space. This is where we are. We would not be here if we didn't have a roof over our head, especially with the rain. Um, and so uh, the last one is also Blackbird VC. Uh, so we've got Melia from Blackbird. Big round of applause for Melia and Abby from Seed Space and Blackbird. And Blackbird is a VC across Australia and New Zealand that invests in tech-enabled businesses. And then the Community Collective. So the Community Collective, if you haven't heard about us, uh, we are a community for community leaders in the Australian and New Zealand startup space. And it's really our vision to be the first place that community leaders think of when they're building and managing communities. All right, I'm now going to introduce Mel and hand over, and we're gonna get the panel up here. So I would just like to introduce Melia. She is a phenomenal woman and a co-founder at the Community Collective as well. We've been uh, connected for uh, some time now, and she's also a community at Blackbird VC as well. So let's give a big round of applause for Mel, and we'll also get the panel up here. So everybody, come on, come on up. Thank you. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah, cool. I feel like you gave me such a nice introduction. I don't need to say anything more about myself. Um, but yeah, for those of you who I haven't met before, I'm Melia from Blackbird and from the CC. So yeah, just checking that. Um, yeah, at Blackbird, we're a venture capital firm, as Paz said, and our mission is to invest in, the, in wild hearts with wild ideas right from the very beginning. So all kinds of ambitious people across Australia and New Zealand. There we go, I'm holding it right now. Um, <laughs> and a big part of how we do that is through how we cultivate community. I'm also very fortunate to be Paz's co-founder, one of the, the three co-founders at the CC. Um, and tonight is just another of the events that we put on every month. We do um, member meetups, we do um, IRL events, panels all around trying to help community leaders be successful in every phase of their career. But enough about me, I'd love to introduce you to our panel tonight. So first up, we have, I've got my notes out of order, so you know, I'm just gonna randomly go through and you can see who I get to first. Um, so first up, we have Marina Wu, who's the co-founder and chief community officer at Early Work. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Woo! If you haven't heard about Early Work, and you should, because they're getting some pretty amazing press for their, uh, their investment recently. <laughs> Early Work is the home for young people creating the careers of tomorrow in tech, startups, and impact. 
And before she went all in on early work, Marina was a product manager at Finder, building the company's newest product, the Finder app. She also led the student-run not-for-profit Generation Entrepreneur, empowering high school students with entrepreneurship programs. So she's been doing community for a while, even though she's still, you know, <laughs> very young and doing all the things, making me feel very, you know, <laughs> yeah, resting on my laurels here. And we also have Yana Belova, who's a community manager at Canva and yeah. elsewhere. <laughs> Woo! Give some love for Yana. Yana is a passionate community builder, a CMX Sydney ambassador, as we heard, and also a digital and community advisor for global startups. I know you're working with a bunch of interesting startups that we're going to hear about tonight. Um, and so, yeah, as, as I kind of touched on, you're working with Canva, Miro, Study Free, which is a Californian startup, and a handful of other startups across APAC, um, the US and Canada. Our third panelist is Ben Davies, community manager at Dovetail. <laughs> Woo! So, I mean, talk about building communities for a while. Ben's been building communities for so long that when he started, MySpace was a thing and YouTube wasn't. <laughs> and Ben wrote that joke, not me. So, <laughs> starting out in health advocacy, he helped rally support for legislation and policy changes like the NDIS, and he found justice for the vulnerable in a royal commission or two. Moving into tech when the internet started working... <laughs> <laughs> he helped found and scale communities for many friends of Blackbird and others, including Canva, Chuffed, and Dovetail. And, pretty exciting for Ben, he's just accepted a role at Smokeball, where he's going to help them launch and scale a new community product. Ooh. Yeah. And our final panellist this evening is Abby Pantano, the co-founder and community connector at Seed Spaces. As we've talked about, the amazing place we are here tonight. Round of applause again for Abby. <laughs> So before founding Seed Spaces, Abby spent 12 years leading marketing and partnership departments for global retail brands and two years leading her own eco-side hustle, The Next Sip. The arrival of COVID saw Abby's retail role made redundant, but gave her an opportunity to wrap up the side hustle, a project which has resulted in burnout, overwhelm, and a feeling of disconnection. With a burning desire to be the change she wanted to see in the world and a unique understanding of the challenges facing purpose-driven entrepreneurs, Abby set out to build a business community dedicated to connection, empowerment, and impact. And I think we can all feel that here tonight. So as you know, we're here at Seed Spaces, a co-work event space and business community for social and eco-minded business founders. They've got over 100 members across Australia. Ooh. And Abby and the team have big plans to create a connected, engaged, and supportive global business community, balancing profit, wellness, and positive impact, all in equal measure. So it's a very varied panel. They've got lots of insights. I can't wait to get started. And as Pat said, we're going to have time for your questions at the end. So, you know, hold on to those. But I love to start by just, you know, defining how you each think about community. Um, I'd love to understand how do each of you define community in your role? And maybe, Abby, I'll start with you. Uh, oh, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, so you can repeat the question? Yeah, how do you define community? How do I define community? Um, I, I suppose... I see community as sort of this share economy. It's a space where um, where you lend help without expectation of anything in return. It's this mentality of pay it forward and knowing that um, in its own way it'll come back to you and it's not about knowing how it'll come back to you, just having that faith um, and having that trust as well within that space that you're sitting in there. Um, so it is, it's also about trust. Yeah, I might just leave it there. Oh. Oh. Yeah, I have a mic. <laughs> yeah. Does it work? Yeah, 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 yeah. it looks like. Um, what I love in community management and what I like, why I believe in communities, that's the synergy that it creates. One plus one is always more than two. When you um, like take one plus one plus one, it's always hundred or maybe uh, like thousand. And there's people who create environment and this environment sets new rules and new norms and new culture and can influence different like um, nations, even nations or uh, like different people and can raise the bar constantly for these people. That's why I believe in community. That's uh, one of the most uh, powerful uh, social instrument existing in our world. And we are so happy to, to see the era of community beginning. So yeah, I think we are super lucky. Thank you. Yeah. Um, great answers, first of all, completely <laughs> agree <laughs> with <laughs> everything. Um, Lots to, um, you know, follow up with. <laughs> so um, yes. I think um, early work is really like a connector of people. We started off during peak COVID. Everyone was during, um, in lockdowns and our demographic were young people who were just getting started in startups, tech jobs. So you were really like alone, essentially. So what early work is really trying to do, and, 
and this is why community is so important for us as well is just really creating the home for people to come to after work or during work as well <laughs> and it's a place where they can meet people who they've never they never would have thought they'd meet so yeah that's what it means okay that is like a really tough act to follow <laughs> yeah you're at the end oh sorry <laughs> Yeah, I'm going first. No, I'm, I'm gonna go. Can I go in the middle? Does that work? Yeah. Okay. Um, also, it's really weird being the panelist rather than the moderator. I'm used to doing that one. That's 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 a fun job. Um, I think for me, community generally is uh, any space where two or more people meet to talk about something that they both need, a problem they need to solve, uh, a piece of freedom that they want to grab for themselves in terms of their life or things like that. Uh, and when you attach that to a brand or a business, then ideally that kind of also links to a goal that the business has. So at Dovetail, for example, it's around understanding customers better. Uh, pretty straightforward, but there's a lot behind that and a lot of conversations. Uh, at uh, Pixabay, where I work with Jess, Hello. Hey. We're gonna say hi to Jess. Hi, Jess. Um, you know, it was it was it was about the freedom to create and to express and to talk to other people who enjoyed and appreciated their art. And I don't know what else I'm missing. Maybe you can fill in later. <laughs> Do you want to? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's kind of community. And th the thing it's not is it's not a forum. It's not a platform. It's it should really span every kind of different medium where that communication can happen. Uh, I think that's slowly becoming a real thing. I think we got stuck in forums, then we got stuck in Slack, then we got stuck in Facebook groups, and finally, maybe because of the pandemic, we're seeing people talk on Zoom and then jump across to Slack and then have a conversation somewhere else, and that, that's cool. That's true community, I think, so, yeah. Yeah, I think you, I, I love that distinction. Actually, a follow-on question for all of you, like, what what isn't community? What's the myth that you see about community? I mean, Ben, you kind of started us off by that idea that community is like, a forum or a platform you know like having a slack channel equals community like what what is a what is something that you know maybe you've experienced or that you see where you think actually that's that's not community that's not working that way you want to start oh, oh, okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get to start ben you can go on <sighs> karma um <laughs> yeah so i think i think in things that are not community are those more transactional kind of itinerary That one-to-one. One. Yeah, that's nascent community. That's like a baby community if you keep fostering that and you keep building those relationships mm -hmm. and encouraging it, but it's not community yet. Um, so that's probably one thing. And the other thing is something that's not networked. So, you know, like a transactional, you can have a thing in a support forum where someone's like, my app's not working and I hate it. And then a support person's like, well, you know, we're fixing it on Tuesday. And that's you know, transactional, but you can also have transactional in like an email or something like that. So I think the potential for that network and multiple people viewing and interacting and then actually using that network and getting other people in to talk to each other, yeah, that's, that's where the line is, I think, for me. All right. <laughs> yeah, anyone want to add to that? Yeah, I think um, just following on what Ben said, I think it's what it's not is a marketing channel. And I think it's very easy to fall into that distinction, distinction where it's like, oh, I'm gonna start a community because that's our marketing and there's like a CAC attached to it and all that sort of stuff. Um, people are smart, they see through bullshit. Um, and I think uh, the mindset that companies have is, oh, we have to put like an ROI to this. We've got to put like a cost to this. And I think um, measurement is important. And as a XPM, I know how important it is, but I think um, when it comes to community, it's really important to think about like the qualitative and just the authenticity about it as well. So, yeah. yeah, what I would add here, I think I have three critically important criteria for community um, personally. The first one is obvious, like same core values, same beliefs. Uh, so when people are definitely aligned, uh, what they think about uh, how they want this world to be and everything, so big picture. The second one is super important for me personally because I strongly believe in communities as safe space where people can express themselves, uh, where, where they can be as they are and not to be afraid like, Okay, what if I will say? Uh, what if I say anything and they won't understand me and ev everything? And the third one is was about interactions too. So that's about uh, being ready to co-create or to help or to like to do anything together to connect to maybe solve the problem existing or just to make the world better or to uh, this here we are getting back to the level one about core values we have the same picture what we want this world to be uh, so we are ready to do anything so for example like 
talk about this, yes, to, to define this picture or maybe to, to build this world or anything. Yeah, so I think these three are the most important to me personally. Yeah, I guess the, the only piece I'll add to that is probably not so much what it isn't, but what it shouldn't be, is it shouldn't be an echo chamber. Um, it should be a space for with diverse opinions and diverse feedback. And, and, um, and I think there can also be a slight misalignment of, of values, but um, there needs to be a, um, an air of curiosity. Mm. Everyone who comes to the space has to be there to, to um, be open and to, to learn from each other and not having a closed-minded situation. So um, I think any space that has curiosity, you can create something from there, but close a mindedness and, and an echo chamber, the chamber is not serving you and it's not serving each other. Um, Cause everyone sees what happened with, with Brexit and with Trump, we get in our echo chamber and then we're so shocked and then these things happen. And so being able to have diverse feedback and opinions to be able to kind of shape our perspective of the world um, and hopefully teach in kind in the process as well. I think that's a great point and something I've, I've observed actually in the early work community is, you know, diversity of opinion, right? Like people won't always agree, there'll be um, some spicy chat, but people Lots kind of, of it. We love the <laughs> spicy chat. <laughs> but you know, that's part of a community coming together and like actually connecting and having a conversation. Uh, Marina, I'd love to kind of double down a little bit on early work because you know, you could view early work as your product is community, right? So can you tell us a little bit about like how you've thought about creating that intentionally and like what some of the kind of steps to success have been so far that you and your co-founders have thought of to kind of create that really active community? Yeah, for sure. So um, today's actually early work's birthday. So Yay! it's <laughs> literally one year ago. Um, shout out to some of our members sitting Nico and Georgia here as well, which is awesome to see. Um, so yeah, like it's no secret that community isn't like an add-on to something. It's not something where you can be like, oh, I'm just gonna slap a community on top of a product I have and you know, it will do its thing. So um, for early work, what we realized at the very start was that there was a central need or like a problem to be solved, putting on my product hat here, that um, young people early in careers or you know, in uni, they just felt lonely in their internships or their startup jobs because they were usually the only person there in like a junior role. If you go to like a CBA or you know any big corporate, you'll have like a hundred other grads who are you know your best friends. But when you're in a startup, that is not the case. You're usually the only one, and um, to be honest, you probably don't know what you're doing either. So we saw this need that people just really wanted to meet each other, learn from each other, and we just really like sort of doubled down on that. So. When we first started, the early work community were some of our um, earliest fans of the newsletter and they were all our friends. And then from there, we really just wanted to like make sure that we preserve that like identity and I think that's so important. So we made sure that every person that sort of comes in is relevant or the people that we like reached out to, they really sort of fit the bill. Um, and what we're starting to see now is that referrals are becoming the biggest acquisition, which is I think a really good way to grow the community. So yeah, to, like, that's why community is so central to what early work does. Um, we, are, we actually had a meeting today to say that we'll probably like autopilot some of the rest of the things we were going to start looking at and just instead double down on making sure that the community is engaged and always like a vibrant, bubbling place to be. So yeah, um, community is at the heart of what we do and any product or service that we build around it is always going to be in service of the community. We're two months in, full time, so you know, early days. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to be done in making sure that community is still like at the heart of what we do. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Um, Jana and Ben, like you know, you both work for startups that have community at their core. And if we kind of take that, what like what Marina said about people coming together to kind of learn and connect with each other, what does that look like when you're building community for a business? And and how might that be different if you're building um, a community that you know your your community practitioners working for Canva, Dovetail, etc. Like how does how does that kind of affect how you think about it? You don't want to. You, you yeah. can. Okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, so, so just to make sure I understand the question, so it's around, you can build any kind of community anywhere in the world around anything, but how do you connect it to an actual brand or exactly. a business? Exactly, yeah, and yeah, maybe okay. like what are some of the successful experiments that you've run in community yeah. for the communities that you've yeah. run for brands? Yeah, so you have to find a common interest, a common cause, or a common purpose. So um, you cannot, and everybody in this room knows this, so I'm probably just preaching to the converter, but you can't, like you said, use it as a marketing tool, you can't shove the product down people's throats uh, or anything like that. You've got to think in terms of 
what is like the intrinsic motivation for members to be a part of that branded community? And then also, what does the business need um, that it can get out of those people connecting? And so in the case of Pixabay, um, which is a community that Canva owns and that Jess now works on, and she's doing a great job, so much better than me. Um, you know, and in the case of, uh, what do you call your community? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, Ronnie has a beautiful community of like uh, teaching people how to use Canva and things like that. Mm -hmm. So in both of those cases, like in in the case of Ronnie's community, especially when he was fully into Canva and in Canva, it was about well, how do we help these people use Canva more effectively? How do we connect them to the right tools? And the people who were part of that community wanted wanted that because that was part of their core business. Um, but underneath all of that was this intrinsic motivator for the members, which is I want financial freedom. If I can teach people how to use Canva, if I can help businesses to, you know, build out their brand kits in Canva and make five thousand dollars a month for that, with that, then I'm free. So I want that. So, you know, there's these top line things that you're actually talking about, but underneath that, for the members, it was I can be free. I can have financial freedom. I can, you know, finish work early to pick up the kids. So. And I imagine like you know, having that as the reason for people to engage in the community is far more meaningful than Canva saying, hey, we have a community, you should join it, learn about Canva. <laughs> but I think sometimes it starts there, yeah. and then hopefully you get a half-decent community manager like Ronnie or Jess or Greta or Georgia or, oh gosh, there's a lot of you. Yeah. Um, you know, and, they, and they find that, that deeper meaning, and then they go, okay, so what does that look like in conversation? What does that actually look like in terms of the like things you're putting in the social architecture of the community? So, yeah, most businesses start with how do we sell the product or how do we deflect support tickets? And sometimes that works by accident. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Anything to add, Yana? Nothing to add. <laughs> he's he's, he's fabulous. <laughs> all right, all right. Fine, You've that's worked right. for a lot of different startups. You're consulting, yeah. you know, at the moment. Like, what are some of the most successful experiments that you've seen run that kind of speak to this, like, you know, whether you're retrofitting purpose in community or you're building it in from the beginning, how do you kind of, what are some great ways you've seen brands that you've worked with test yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I actually work with different uh, type of companies. They are all startups, I mean, but they are at the very different stages. Some of them are like Miro or Canva. They're big enough, so we can say like a giant startup. They're not startups already, yes, without that big companies. And some of them are like pre-seed stage, very early stage. And what I see here, what is, what is common between all of them is um, the most important thing to build the community for these companies is to find this, mm, I will try to explain. I try to visualize sort of a cake of three layers cake. <laughs> and uh, like the top of this cake, is a um, philosophy, the most important thing, like the vision, the vision, wh why this company exists, what is, what is it for, why they build it, why the founders founded this, that's the most important layers. But we don't, uh, we can't, just simply cannot uh, like work daily keeping only this um, layer in mind because we have to interact, we have to work, we have to do routine, that's why we have two extra layers. The second layer down, uh, like b below that one, is a layer of, um, character dy dynamic. That's how you member, the member of your community can mm, dy dynamically change in this community because we all come to the community because we want something for us. Not just we believe in this. Yes, that's important to believe in <laughs> like anything, but we want to like, we want to um, um, see, each, um, see ourselves better in like in a month or in a like couple of months. And, and that's what the company can give you like according to these core values. For example, okay, enter to our community, learn from our community members, or start something yourself, or just do something for the reason you, you believe. And the very, um, the down layer, the third layer, is about um, as a simple everyday actions, step by step, like bite size actions. For example, what we do, yes. For example, I, I, I have a, a great idea of building uh, in Miro, of connecting Mironiers uh, all around the world to make them believe the same things. But how will I do this? I will show them how they can uh, learn from this community, how they can contribute, how they can like give back to this community, how they can, for example, learn from this community. Okay, you can be a leader, you can start, for example, like uh, the club, 
uh, inside Miro and you will be a leader of this club and you will learn how to be a leader. That's great. That's what community gives you and you give back. That's about the like dynamic, the, the middle layer. And this bite-sized layer, the, the layer of actions every day, daily that we take, uh, is a layer when we, for example, when we offer, okay, let's organize a meetup tomorrow. Can you do this? Can you help me? Okay, let's do this together. Or for example, um, let's celebrate everyone's birthday monthly. That's a great tradition. That's what rituals help you. Um, they help you to make this cake, that put all the layers together and stick them together and work them together. That's how I see this. So I, I love this cake idea. Yeah. <laughs> and I really want some cake now. <laughs> Plus one for cake, can we? <laughs> Communicate. <laughs> <laughs> um, you kind of all touched on it, and I'd love to like hear, just unpack this a little bit more before we move on. Like this idea of kind of giving the community a job. You know, I think that there's a really diff there's an important distinction, and it, it comes back to like the marketing. You know, community is not necessarily marketing that you mentioned, Marina. Of like, you know, if if you're just like the moderator in the forum or the person running the event and you're constantly going, hey, come to this thing, like, hey, you know, part say happy birthday to people, hey, like, you know, tell us what you thought of this event, like, that's not, you know, that's a pretty stale community, like, can you each talk about, or anyone who wants to jump in, like, Abby, I don't know if you've, you've got an interesting insight having navigated this in IRL and also in a um, digital space, like, how do you kind of like get the community to be self-sufficient and self-sustaining? I think um, it's interesting because particularly opening a business through the pandemic and for people to be able to see that struggle. And I think part of it has been also having a level of um, being a bit raw through the experience and having it be okay to be a little bit raw through the experience. Um, because it's actually all right to ask for help. And that was the first mistake I made with my first business was, I was like, I have to do everything on my own. I have to know everything, I have to be everyone. And asking for help is a sign of weakness that I wasn't ready to take this leap and I should still be in corporate. And, um, and that's why I had such a terrible experience. And, and so going through the space, um, we kind of opened our doors. We had um, people came in because they loved the space and it was beautiful, but they really were just here for a desk, not for the community. Um, we kept going, you know, this is about the community, it's about the community, but the, there was a different energy. Um, and it was the f probably the first lockdown that we'd had while we had the space where everyone was like, how, how can I help? And it kind of that recognition of when everything seems to be crumbling around the outside, you're like, I just want to be able to help something. What's the tangible thing I can do? Um, and it took me a really long time to say yes. And, it's, and it actually took me pretty much starting to burn out again in this world going, what am I doing? I, I, I know better than this and just to be to open yourself to accepting, which completely changes your experience as a business owner to go, when people offer to help, they want to help you. It's not because they're expecting something in return, but they actually want to help. And, um, and it's kind of like if you go to a house party and you go, can I do the dishes? And they go, oh no, get out, get out, get out. And you're like, no, but I actually want to do the dishes. I'd like to, <laughs> I'd also like to have a job because I can't pet the dog all night. So yeah, <laughs> um, and it's kind of that feeling of like, it was our party, not just your party. And I'm just coming up and leaving. Um, and I think that there is like a, I mean, Nico's a, an amazing example of this. He's helped with, we had a, um, a refugee advocacy and allyship event and Nico's got involved with that. Even with this, he's like helping us about the stuff. And I feel like Nico's really like, it's part of our, that core community. And I like to feel like Nico, like Nico is seed spaces, right? Um, so I think it's, it becomes this shared venture where everyone gets to be a part of it. And it's not actually my space, it's our space. And I think that also becomes a greater respect for what you do. And also there's a time there's time that if you're charging for your membership and people go, I'm actually financially not in the position going, okay, well let's dream up something together because I bet you've got a skill set that I need and I don't have all the time and money to put into it. So let's do an exchange. So it's, it's completely changed my whole experience of building a business. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so inspiring. Actually, I want to add, I think that your story shows, uh, n um, it highlights actually the main idea of the, the middle layer of the cake, because <laughs> <laughs> I will continue. Yeah, uh, the middle layer of the cake. Why? Because it's about developing the character. It's about finding the role, the right role for any community member and for giving this role. So you really have to give it and like uh, leave it and let, let him or her do this. 
So it's about delegating, but delegating very mindfully. Not just like, I don't want to do this job, take this. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you're a community member. Yeah, giving the community a job is not giving them all the jobs you don't want. Yes, <laughs> definitely. You just, and you have to focus on everyone's character mm. to see what jobs will work for this person. Probably, um, for example, I had a great experience in Russia while living in Russia in Moscow. Uh, we built um, Russian Yelp, yelp.com, but in mm. Russia. So it was a really, um, um, extraordinary experience because 91 cities of Russia, so that really huge community with so many different reviews, so it was really, really popular, like 6,000 uh, different companies um, uh, engaged and having their account there, so that was really, really giant, really awesome, and what I've experienced, our, the, most, the most dedicated, the most active community members were those whom uh, we hold, uh, we actually helped them to find their niche. They couldn't do this with their jobs. They couldn't do this in their families, for example, because, yeah, they felt like I, we are doing the right thing, but there is something more that I can do. Mm. But I don't know where and why and how. And with uh, our team of community ma managers, we helped them to find this niche. Okay, you can be what you want to be, like for example, you can be an event coordinator, or you can be a PR manager, or you can like build your own company. And they believed in themselves, so that that's really worked, and that's why I believe that given um, the opportunity to to your community members to to um, show their talents and to to show what they can do, it can be that's the most important thing we can give them, and that's why we we, we have a great uh, impact back. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so for early work, we started online and everyone was really just like a name and like a little PFP on Slack. So I think at the very start, we tried to be more hands-on and create more like structure around it. So at the early days when it was just like, you know, 10, 20 people, it was really easy to see who are the people who just like message every day, the people who just like show up every day. and we thought like, okay, these people clearly are getting something out of this. How can we let them feel even like more involved with the community? So very early on, we um, created this thing called the Keen Beans. So they are um, essentially our community advisors. Yeah, we have a little, like a little bean emoji for them. <laughs> so um, essentially what we're trying to do <laughs> is just um, really give people like a role, a role that really gives them the power to be like, holy shit, like, I am a part of this community. I'm allowed to like freely express what I think, what can be better, what is good, what's not working. To think like an owner, right? Exactly, exactly. They really like own a slice of the community. So I think since everything was online, we had to like place a little bit more structure around it. But yeah, I think it was a really smart thing for us to do because there were three of us and you know, the community was growing. So naturally we had to get more people on board to I guess like represent early work. And um, I'd like to think the Keen Beans were very happy to do so. And um, yeah, what we're doing now is actually creating like a rotational system. So every six months, there's like a new generation of keen beans. So that way we get like fresh ideas always coming into the community. And hopefully s as someone who's been a keen bean before, they feel like, holy shit, this is like a part of my life. And then I feel more inclined to like, you know, keep contributing. And yeah, we're trying to scale this to what we call our pod mods. Yes, we like our rhymes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, the pod mods are really about like those niche sub communities. So I don't know a lot about like sustainability, but there are people who know a lot about it. So what can we do as early work founders to empower those people who are much smarter and more knowledgeable than us to really create their own sub community? So that's how we kind of think about um, getting the I guess community flywheel going. Um, okay, so at Pixabay and also at Reach Out, which is like a mental health community that I was managing a long time ago now, uh, back in the MySpace days. <laughs> um, we ran a survey to go why, uh, ran a survey asking all of our members why they contributed to the community. Uh, and the overwhelming answer in both of those communities was, I'm wondering if anyone can guess what the answer was. I want to help. Yeah, I want to help, I want to give back as well, you know? That was the same answer, completely different communities, but I want to give back. You've given me all these nice things, in the case of Pixabay, nice art, and it, um, in the case of Reach Out, lots of like uh, clinical and mental health support. Mm. In both cases, they wanted to volunteer because they wanted to give back. So the motivation's like very there in most cases, especially if you're at the stage where 
you have enough members where you need help from your members to keep going. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really a question of giving people the agency, mm -hmm. uh, giving them the, your, which I think we've heard four times over. Um, <laughs> so I'm not gonna go over that. But the only thing I'd add is um, there'll be a lack of confidence mm -hmm. in taking that agency the first few times you do it. Because mm -hmm. until you see other people do it, you don't have their social proofs, so you're like, I don't know if I can go and just talk to that person or tell them why their art sucks. Sorry, that's how Pixabay works. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah um, that was like an in-joke between two people, sorry. <laughs> Go to Pixabay, you'll understand. Um, <laughs> sorry, Jess. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, so basically what you want to do is you want to step it out really specifically and clearly the first few times, like, yeah. hey, can you just go and give that user some feedback? Here's some feedback you could give them, or yeah. do you want to support this person? You've lived through that. Um, you can tell them what your lived experience is like, and that will help them. Step it out, and then they'll do that. There'll be that social proof. Mm -hmm. And then you can keep doing that, and eventually, you know, it kind of scales. And then you can have like an ambassador or a volunteer program or, you know, whatever. And that kind of adds a badge. It adds status, saying, yes, I have the authority to do that, which also gives them the agency. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, um, I think like, well, oh. Oh, is that better? <laughs> Am I too close now? <laughs> Loud noises. Whoa, we can hear you. We can hear you so much louder. <laughs> For better or worse, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I think like a, a good example of that um, is you know in tech we often talk about like do things that don't scale in the early stages, and I think that's true of community where like you need to in my in my experience over over service like giving people like that extra hand holding and like here's how you might respond to someone here's how you can take part in this like. It's almost like um, when you have, um, if anyone's ever done like skipping rope where you have the two different ropes and you know people when you're a kid like you would watch it and you, you would never like maybe you guys are braver than me, you would never run in and just start jumping on the ropes but you watch and if you see other people doing that jumping then you kind of go okay yeah I see how that works I can run in and do that too and I think you have to as community managers you need to be able to like show like bring people on the journey and then give them the kind of you know confidence and the wherewithal and the agency as you touched on to, to go and to do that, you know? Um, Be that cake. On that note, it reminds me of actually, um, it was a video that Warwick sent over to me when he first started. And it was, um, it's a video of a guy who's at, um, I think it's called like Sasquatch Festival or something, and he's dancing on a hill. Have you ever seen this? And then um, he's dancing on a hill, and then one guy comes to join him, and then another guy comes to join him. But like to start off, they call him the lone nut. And it's like, and how as a community manager, when you start off, you are actually the lone nut, and you're hoping that one person's <laughs> going to take the leap of faith. Like I remember when I first starting, it's like starting a community. It's like, first of all, it's such a hard thing to like, how do you solidify a community? Because it's a feeling, right? It's like it's something that we take for granted every day. And so to be like, I'm starting a community and it's one person and they're like, where are your people? And I was like, they'll be here soon. <laughs> and yeah, and it, and it was that power to be able to like sell the dream, but also help them to sell the dream onto the next person. And it's like, and I always joke about with Nim, how I was like, thank you for like taking me out of the one lone nut <laughs> space. It's like now we get to be a community. But um, it was, yeah, the power that's in those first few members, and it's the hardest ones to get, but they'll be your, like, deepest, hardest advocates right from that point, yeah. yeah. Can I add one thing really, really quickly? Mm -hmm. um, you have to say thank you. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, my God, everyone forgets to do that. Um, so swag, just nice personal notes, giving them more contact and connection mm -hmm. than you can to the rest of the community because, you know, they get big and you can't talk to everyone. Mm -hmm. All of that really matters to every member I've ever talked to. Mm -hmm. So do that and show that appreciation. Um, yeah, or don't and they'll go away. <laughs> yeah. yeah, And yeah. highlight an, uh, good examples. I think that's important to show the role model. Like this is the great behavior. This is what we all have to do. Look at him or her, like that's works. Yeah, because it, it creates new role models to follow. Yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> one more question and then we're going to open up to the, the folks here tonight. Um, how do you know when a community is working? Maybe, maybe I'll jump in. Um, I was Go actually talking it. to Ben about this as we were sitting right there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think there was a really special moment in the early work community where like myself, Dan, Jono, I think we just didn't log on to Slack for a whole day. And then we were like, holy shit it's still alive and like, the <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. So I think um, it gets, it is very hard at the start. It's literally like pushing water uphill um, to the point like you, 
do things that don't scale. I'd get people DM me being like, oh, Marina, like, you know, how, like, can you give me some tips about product management? Because, you know, it's a careers community. And I'm like, I will answer you if you post it in the public channel so it looks like there's <laughs> stuff going on. <laughs> so so you, you do have to um, shove yeah. a little bit at the start and do that, like, quite consistently. And to be honest, there were, p p like, moments in time where we thought, like, the community was going to die. And, um, like, I don't know what was going on, but for two weeks, like, no one said anything, and we were like, holy shit. So it was at that point where we just had to, like, really, like, talk to everybody one-on-one, -on -one, like, post a lot ourselves, and then it gets to a point, and reply to everyone as well. Like, reply yeah. to everyone until you literally can't do it anymore. Every single intro, like, hi, my name is X, you do the, like, we would all reply. So it's like making people feel loved. Yeah. And the point about like award rewards and incentives as well, some like gimmicky stuff really works. Like mm -hmm. we give people NFTs. So <laughs> like <laughs> you know, this this sort of thing really, really works. So yeah, back to the question. Um you know what kind of works when you can like actually step back, like observe, and you're like, oh my god, it's like running itself. And I learned today it's called the bus factor, where um if you get hit by a bus, what's the level of like, like how what happens if yeah, what happens? If you get hit by a bus, what happens to your career? Yeah, like, is the risk high? Is the risk low? So I learned today it was called the bus factor. So I may be the only one who calls it that. Oh, so shit, okay. <laughs> that, that's some infra engineers, mm. that's about it. Oh, yeah. okay, well, maybe we can t turn it into a thing. Um, <laughs> but, of course, like, metrics and things are still important. Um, we look at, like, the wows and dows and everything as, like, a proxy for our goal, which is, like, a lovable community. They're not can perfect. You just, can you explain that acronym for oh people yeah, who don't know Oh, yeah, sorry. Daily active users, weekly active users. So um, we're on Slack, so we don't have a lot of option, but it's kind of, like, an indication that we're going the right direction. And sometimes it's like, oh, you feel like it's all going well, you look at the numbers and it's a bit like, <laughs> oops, <laughs> like something <laughs> happened. So I think it's like really a combination of like the feeling that you can step away and the community will still go and just like looking at whatever metrics or like testimonials even are really good and just like something to give you like indications that things are working. Yeah, I'll stop there. Love it. Anyone want to add anything to that? Or well, mic drop from Marina. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have a small, just small addition. I think that the um, mm, most important metric for me is the number of right initiatives because it's like it's quantitative and qualitative uh, like in the same time because like the number is important if you have just a couple of good initiatives that's right but your community is not growing so dynamic is important but the right initiative shows that your community understands what what are you all about what they can create and sometimes I create communities just 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 for me, <laughs> no, not for the companies, just like travelers community, walkers community, readers community, because just I, I enjoy this process. And uh, once I created one community, but I didn't have much time, so I didn't spend much time on guiding this community. I just just try to, to help them connect each other. And when they came to me after a week with so many ideas like we connected in zoom call and we decided we want to do this this and that and also we have such an initiative and also we uh, decided to organize picnics uh, monthly so you're invited so <laughs> i felt like what <laughs> they're like yeah we will invite you and we have a surprise for you so please come and it was so like enormously good because yeah they caught the idea they developed this idea and they came to me with so many great initiatives and I think that is important they sti they're still alive I don't manage them <laughs> they're still alive <laughs> 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 um, does this does it, has anyone read um, buzzing communities by Richard Millington yeah yeah, yeah okay one Strong yes from Paz. it's a pretty good book uh, more people should read that but he talks about community life cycles so you have inception you know baby community establishment maturity where it's you know big and thriving and if the bus fact is very low if you get hit by a bus <laughs> you're good um, and then there's saturation where it's like packed to the rafters and like you know there's too many people not everyone knows anyone but the, the thing for me where it's really thriving is the next step which is mitosis where it spontaneously splits off and people like you know start talking about making videos or animations uh, in the case of this creative community, um, you know, and they, they start creating their own little sub communities all by themselves. That's when you like really nailed it. 100%. I remember yeah. like in the Giants um, mentoring program that we run at Blackbird, um, it runs mostly on Slack and uh, other platforms. And I like hadn't looked at Slack for a while and I was like looking at what channels there were and anyone can create channels. Yeah. And there was like 40 channels 
with like all these members <laughs> talking about from? things like med tech, you know, health tech, like the climate people. Like I was like, wow, didn't know any of these existed. <laughs> and they're really busy. So it was like that, yeah, my toast was sort of like, cool. It's just kind of like developing a life of its own. And I think you've all touched on this idea that like, the ultimate metric of a community being successful is a community thriving without you even, you know, in your case, Yana, being part of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's such an awesome place to kind of jump off for audience QA. Anyone got any questions that they would love to, to ask our panel tonight? Yeah. Go for it. Hello. Um, so I'm a mental health guy. Um, and you guys have got a huge impact and a huge respons responsibility as well. So my question is, how do you make sure that you don't get burnt out? Because you guys need to be kind of turned on 100% of the time. So how do you make sure that you're, that you're not? Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah, 100%. Um, I, can, I can talk t about it from a sort of semi-clinical perspective because uh, in career one, I was sort of in mental health advocacy did a lot of work there, had to have clinical supervision where you talk to a therapist to sort of check how you're going with all the hectic things that you deal with. Um, and so uh, one of the keys to avoiding or managing or minimizing burnout in, in that setting is having really clear boundaries for yourself and clear communicating those boundaries really clearly with all your stakeholders. So, you know, it's everyone has to define their own boundaries. And for some people, that are like me, I try and keep it to nine to five, you know? And if I need to be on at like 10 o'clock at night to deal with some sort of crisis, then I might do that a few times, but then I'm gonna be saying, yeah, we have like a, we have a team issue here. We have to hire someone who can stay up late or cover that or, you know, set a boundary around that kind of thing. So I think that's the first thing. Second thing is good old self-care. You know, I went in a float tank today for the first <laughs> time. <laughs> It was kind of good. I don't know if I'll do that as self-care again, but like treat yourself. Um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over because I feel like a lot of other people will know a lot of stuff about this. So, yeah. No, I'd like to hear from you guys. I'm two months into this, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can compare this with maybe a parent-child behavior because it's like when you love someone too much, sometimes it's driving you crazy. You're like, I want to kill you, but I love you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the same, because sometimes you're managing community and you're like, what are you doing? I hate this, and then like, but no, I love you and I will work with you. And it, it, it really turns into love. It all turns into love again and again, because we discussed this with past today, and I asked like, how do you handle all of this? It's too much for a human. <laughs> how do you do this? I don't know, still, it's too much for a human. <laughs> but, uh, but what I feel, it all starts with love and it has all end with love because you're not feel like too stressed when you're in the right place with the right people. Like today, for example, I'm totally relaxed because like, yes, that's our event. We have to think about like everything, but I'm not stressed at all because I'm at home. With you, I'm, I'm here, I'm like, I'm okay. So I'm not stressed at all uh, while like working with communities also. So that's, that's maybe my question, I don't have therapist, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's funny you mentioned therapist, because um, I remember when I, um, a few years back, when I was put on a mental health plan and going to see a psychologist, and <laughs> I recognized that my whole issue was a lack of boundaries. Mm -hmm. It was like, it, it sh like, I kept on bringing it, she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm getting this sense. I think I actually had been, I was so worried about someone else. I'd spoken about her for 45 minutes when I just don't know about what to do. And she's like, are you worried that you spent about three quarters of this session with me worried about someone else <laughs> rather than talking about your own things? And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> she's like, yeah, I think we've got a boundary <laughs> issue here. <laughs> and um, and it's, <laughs> it's kind of a, an interesting one because I feel like part of, particularly within a physical space, you're quite sensitive to, is it a bit too warm? Is it a bit too cold? Even while we were talking and I was like, trying to get all these attention because I was like, I'm gonna turn on the air con. And, <laughs> 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 and before we sit down, I was like, I'm just gonna light a candle and then we can just kind of enjoy. And so it's, um, it's kind of a funny thing because you're constantly aware of how is everyone feeling and you want everyone to feel good, but having to reinforce that boundary for yourself. Um, and I think like one piece from a physical space perspective that I've, I kind of put it in more for me, but I knew other people would benefit from it, is across the hall is a quiet room. 
So over here is a collaborative space. Um, you, it's a bit more open to if you want to come up, have a little bit of, ch of a chat, because some people do come here to have that, that um, interactive experience. But some people are like, I just need to come in and do deep work. And also, you can't always do the chat, because you'll never do the deep work. So for me, having that room where it's not even really for other people, it's for me to go, it's OK for you not to talk to other people right now. And they're actually expecting you not to talk to them. <laughs> It's just like, oh, it's a little bit of a, it can be a bit of a relief. But so I think it, it is a good reminder, though, on the boundaries. And I think um, it's, yeah, it, it, it's definitely a journey. And I think the, the other piece, which I'm quite, we're still recovering from the lockdowns. So we're paying back our debts. But mm -hmm. and fortunately, things are looking better. But if anyone needs an event space. <laughs> so yeah. um, but um, one thing I'm really, really putting, um, the, it was really great advice from one of our members was to front load your day with the things that make you happy. Rather than um, going, if I get these things done, then I get this, to go, no, actually, I'm going to do these things first. I'm going to treat myself because it's fucking worth it. And then my day is going to pan out the way it's going to pan out. And I think that was one of like my favorite bits of advice. And fucking Nina got involved. It's been raining for three months. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I'm looking forward to getting back to that because I'm not really a wet person. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a classic question. Um, for me, I'm actually managing a community full time, plus I have my own community. So it's double messages. Oh, hey, Veronica, hello, my housemate. Um, double, <laughs> double LinkedIn messages, double emails, double Slacks soon. Um, do you reply to everyone? Do you, because I just feel like I miss things sometimes. And I know it's probably not great for your brand to do that, but then also I am one human. So I don't know if you have any recommendations around messages and keeping on top of those. Um, maybe I'll jump in there because I like side hustled early work for the first year while working full time. Um, so yeah, I think it's always hard to like do a nine to five, nine to six, whatever job, and then also come back home and have to do something else. It's usually doable until something like at work, like oversteps the boundaries and then things are just like a downward spiral from there. At least that's what I found. Um, I, at the very start, like to be honest, it was quite hard because you did feel like obligated to like answer every single question and like reply to every single thread. But I think um, what what I did actually, this is very tactical. I like block out a one hour in my calendar and I just put reminders to the Slack messages that all like fire in that one hour. So I know like at five o'clock there's going to be like a onslaught of messages, but that's okay because I've got this one hour to do nothing except like clear that out. And I think um, actually getting through all those messages in one go, it might be a bit like contradictory. It's actually like it takes the mental weight off those messages off you as well. Because I get a lot of anxiety when I'm not like inbox zero and I, I'm like, holy shit, I need to reply to so many people. Like it's much, well, I found it much easier when I just like stopped, did everything in like a block or two blocks and then you can be like, holy shit, I'm free. So, and then you can focus on your energy and the thinking on like the hard stuff, like how do you incentivize people to build their sub-communities? Like that's the shit that you should be spending your time on. So, and not be so like bogged down in the day to day. So I think it's hard, but like, I hope that little tip helps. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, okay, sure. Um, I think just to add to that, like, th it's easy to get swept up in all of the ways people are trying to get at you in the community at all times and all their questions are coming to you and it can be very easy to feel overwhelmed and flatten every request to the same level of like an avalanche of comms. Mm. But I think you've, you know, articulated it well, like if you can batch those things, but also like, like, at the end of the day, if you don't get back to someone in two hours, that it's not going to be the end of the world. Yeah. So most of the things that you can deal, like communicate to people, they're actually like, I have to remind myself when I'm like, you know, oh my God, the slack on giants is like out of control. Like, when am I going to get to that? I'm like, this is a free community. <laughs> they're all, like most of these people also have jobs. Like, they're not, the world is not going to end if I don't reply to them in, in two hours or a day people are pretty understanding so i think like managing your own time but then also just sometimes just reminding yourself like if you don't get through everything in a day like community is mostly asynchronous so like you never it's never going to be like completely done yeah. I, I just want to add one 
there's a paradox actually in I mean in my career because when I used to work uh, with one community just just one I was like overload it was mm, 20, 20 hours of working per 24. It was impossible like to survive. Now I manage six communities uh, and volunteer a lot. Yeah, so I can say, <laughs> I can say like, yeah, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a strategic advisor for community management with six companies. Two of them are Miro and Canva, so that's much. And like I have to work and hands on too, but it's much easier because you set the rules. It's like playing chess with like, for different on f for different uh, tables simultaneously. That's not about like sitting in front of one table, being totally involved in what's happening here in this game. No, you just remember like you're above of it. You just see like okay, I have six tables of chess. Here, there, there. Okay, <laughs> I'm done. I go like to spend time with my daughter because my daughter is four years old. She needs me more than my communities need me. So I just like, okay, I'm done, 6 p.m., bye guys, that's okay. Because I set the rules and they know these rules and these rules are voiced. I said this aloud, like, okay guys, I, ask, I, I answer you uh, all your questions once a day, keep waiting, that's okay, no one will die. So <laughs> that's, that's right. Um, I love it when you get spammed with DMs because that's a really good opportunity to connect two members together to solve each other's problems. Mm -hmm. So that's like always a good game to play if you can, especially if you kind of know enough members, start a new thread, start a new Slack channel, uh, whatever it is, start set up a meetup and go, oh, everyone's worried about X. Let's go talk about it in a meetup or something like that. So take advantage of that. It's, it's an unmet need and you can get the members to meet each other's needs because, you know, it's, it's a network. So, you know, make it a network. Um, the second thing I think you've kind of touched on is have clear guidelines in the community about when you will respond, what you'll respond to, and where to go if you aren't going to respond to that question and kind of stick to them. Uh, and then the third thing is like social architecture and knowledge management. So thinking about, um, like we kind of dealt with this at Pixabay a little bit. We had to, we have, you know, people making videos, people making photos, people making illustrations, and they were all asking questions in each other's threads, and the photographers were like, F off, I'm a bloody photographer and you're, you know. So we were kind of like, go here if you're an illustrator and ask your questions there, you know. Uh, and likewise, write a blog post, write an article, have some kind of help terms if you get the same question 500 times and deflect it, yeah. Oh, and ask for help. <laughs> just, just ask for help, yeah. What a great place to end. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. We're going to stick around. We've got time for drinks. We've got time for food. Come out and say hi and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.